All right, I'm Richard Ayler, and today I'm going to be talking about non-tuberculous uh, pulmonary mycobacteria. Uh, as I said, this is an important topic that we all need to be aware of, and it's one that um, causes a lot of confusion, and we certainly see a lot of it um, in our patient populations. So what are some initial considerations? We all, there's this kind of alphabet soup. We always hear about MAC, MAI, MFC, MOTT, NTM, ATM. Um, the last one is actually a type of banking device. No, actually that stands for atypical mycobacteria, but you hear all these terms. For the purposes of, of this talk, I think NTM or non-tuberculous mycobacteria is the most commonly, I think the, the best um, nomenclature that I tend to use. Now, there's more than 125 non-tuberculous mycobacteria species, but so it can be very confusing. A lot of times we get consults that say there's, let's say, um, there's mycobacterium zenopii or there, there's, you know, insert your unusual term after the, after the word mycobacterium. What do I do with this? Well, the important thing to remember is there's only a few NTM species that are truly pathogenic to humans. So you don't really need to know 125 species. You really need to know the ones that typically cause human disease. And they are usually M MAC or MAI, um, M. fortuitum, um, M. abscessus, uh, and of course, fortuitum and abscessus are among what are known as the rapid growers, and M. cansaceae, which we don't see a lot of here in Florida, it tends to be more predominant in, take, just take a guess, where would Kansasii be? In the Midwest, right? Kansas and Midwest, exactly. So NTM organisms are, are sort of widely distributed in the environment and people acquire them because they have some factor that causes them to be an impaired host. Uh, so as a result, they can be found in surface water, tap water, in the soil, domestic or wild animals, milk, food products, and so forth. And the distribution of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, particularly non-MAC species, is often what's in your water system. Um, there's not a clear model of transmission but we know that person-to-person -person transmission is thought not to occur or to be very uncommon. And as I said, primarily an environmental reservoir of infection. So the way that most people get non-tuberculous mycobacteria is they just do their, at, their usual um, activities of daily living. Like, for example, taking a shower. If you take a shower in the morning, I'm sure all of you did, and... Um, <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> you get that big mist coming at you, especially on a sort of a cold morning, the hot water, and you get that mist coming up. And what do you do when you're taking a shower? You breathe, right? So you inhale the non-tuberculous mycobacteria into your lungs. And all of us have this happen to us every day. But because we're not impaired hosts, our clearance mechanisms clear the non-tuberculous mycobacteria from our lungs, and we go on, and we're not infected. Now, you can also acquire um, NTM from vegetation, from drinking from water fountains, from walking around outside. Let's say you're walking outside, uh, you know, in your neighborhood, and there's a sprinkler on, and you get a mist, right? Or you go to Bush Gardens or a theme park, and they have, in the summertime, and they have those fans going with that water that you don't know where it's coming from, and it's blowing in your face. So the point is it's hard to avoid picking up these organisms. So what are the major clinical syndromes with NTM infection? So you have progressive pulmonary disease. That's what we typically see in patients with COPD with chronic lung disease where they get, um, they get uh, infection with this organism. It may be a, f a fibronodular disease or it may be a cavitary disease, for example. But progressive pulmonary disease, that's the most common form that we see involving the respiratory tract in our elderly patients. You get superficial lymphadenitis. That's a little less common. Sometimes we see it uh, with kids with MAI or scrofulosiums. Occasionally with, we can see TB lymphadenitis. Um, but again, that's not a NTM syndrome. 
we can see uh, disseminated disease in the immunocompromised. Again, that's the impaired host. Tends to be less pulmonary, more generalized, right? You see generalized lymphadenopathy, lymphadenitis with HIV tends to be responsive to, um, to uh, treatment of the immune system deficit with antiretroviral therapy. <coughs> And uh, you can also see skin and soft tissue disease from direct inoculation, just like the gentleman who came in. It, it might be plausible that he had a uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, particularly if it were chronic, associated with like a sclerotic appearance to the tissue, and had a, uh, the appearance of a cold lymphadenitis. That would be associated with an NTM infection. <coughs> So there's a lot of species differences with non-tuberculous mycobacteria based on where you come from. So let's say if you were from Canada, how many, anybody from Canada? Here, no, nobody from Canada. So you, you might see um, less Kansasii, but you might see, consequently see more Xenopii or, or, or Fortuitum. Actually, they do see Kansasii there. So you, you may see less um, Malmanens, for example. Um, here in the United States, as we've seen, um, you can see Fortuitum, you can see MAC, you can see a lot of abscesses, but uh, you don't see as much of the Xenopii strain, uh, for example. Again, if you were from Australia, they have their own uh, individual uh, species that, are, that tend to be more common, and, uh, and so does Japan, for example. So where you're located makes a big difference geographically. What's some epidemiology of non-tuberculous mycobacteria in the U.S.? So we tend to see this is a disease of older individuals. The average age or the mean age is 57 years. The most common NTM organism is MAC. Uh, and then we see the rapid growers after that. And then we see about 10% of cases with Kansasii. This tends to be a disease of men. The reason for that, I think it's because there's a... Um, there's an abnormal distribution of tobacco use and chronic lung disease in men in the U.S. And in my institution where I practice at a veterans hospital, <clears throat> we tend to see a lot of um, more men with non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. Now, M. abscessus, this is the most important uh, rapid grower that's a human pathogen. We'll talk a little more in detail about it in just a moment. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> So what are some uh, epidemiologic trends in mycobacterial disease that we're seeing in the U.S. in the last few years? Well, <clears throat> you look at MTB complex, which is the lighter gray color, we're seeing um, a decrease in the, the prevalence of a positive culture with MTB. Uh, and we know that for a fact. That, as a matter of fact, TB is at its lowest level in the U.S. ever. Um, this is the trend every year. We're seeing a reduction in tuberculosis cases. But look at the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We're actually seeing NTM infections um, become equivalent and near equivalent in 2007, and we're in 2013. By now, these lines have probably crossed. So, I mean, this is a major clinical significance. If you see someone with a positive AFB culture nowadays in the U.S., it's more likely it's an NTM infection than MTB. Now, does that mean we shouldn't put somebody in respiratory precautions with a positive AFB specimen who has risk factors for TB? Well, um, of course it doesn't. We, we definitely should. We need to rule out tuberculosis from a public health standpoint, and also because the treatment of TB is, is different, of course. But be advised that we're likely to see NTM infections much more, much more commonly in the U.S. than we are MTB because of these epidemiologic trends. Now, there's a lot of host defense, there's host defenses among NTB, uh, excuse me, NTM infections that uh, affect our ability to ward off these infections, but also deficiencies in, in these different host defenses increase the risk that we will develop a clinical infection. Epithelial integrity, for example, gastric pH, so individuals who are on um, on drugs uh, such as proton pump inhibitors or, um, uh, you know, or other drugs can, uh, it, it can increase their likelihood of getting infected. There are certain uh, subcomponents of, of uh, cytokines and chemokines uh, 
TNF alpha we know um, is an important factor in um, in host defenses against both NTM and TB infections. Interferon gamma deficiencies can cause uh, an increase in your uh, susceptibility to NTM infections and in others. So keep in mind keep in mind that host defenses can affect your ability to acquire non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Now, um, just to talk about the clinical presentation of MAC lung disease, because this is the most important and significant NTM infection that we see. What are the different manifestations of this infection more specifically? Well, in patients who have pre-existing lung disease, the most common manifestations are the fibrocavitary disease. These are the patients who present on CT scan with cavities adjacent to a fibrotic infection and, um, and these patients can be very frustrating to treat although they do tend to tolerate treatment better than, uh, than other patient demographics. Then we have patients with no previous history of lung disease and these patients tend to be the ones that have impaired mechanisms of clearance. So they don't clear non-tuberculous mycobacteria as well and as a result they become susceptible. This is the phenomenon that we see that's known as nodular bronchiectasis and it tends to have a predisposition to women. Um, we'll talk about uh, that in just a second. Now we also see hot tub lung or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. These are infection. These are not necessarily infections. They're more an immune system manifestation of exposure. So occasionally somebody will be in a hot tub. They'll develop a pneumonitis and it'll be due to non-tuberculous mycobacterial organisms in the water and inhalation of those organisms. Again, we said HIV patients more likely manifest as extrapulmonary disseminated disease. And then we have patients who have certain immune system deficits who become infected like IL-12 or gamma interferon. And it's in those patients that interferon gamma may be the most helpful. So this is your, what is known as your zeal uh, Nielsen or zeal Nielsen stain, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, your AFB smear. And we can see um, these clumps of, uh, uh, intracellular non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Some of them are extracellular. You see them here. Um, and so we talk about common NTM pathogens and less common pathogens. So as we've established, you have avium and intracellular. Those are your MAC, your mycobacterium avium complex. Then you have MKENS ACI. And then you have your rapid growers, M. obsessus, M. chelonii, for example, are the most common of the rapid growers that are pulmonary pathogens. Now, how about the infrequent ones? We see those listed here, including Xenopi, Solgai, um, Malmoens, and M. fortuitum. And then we have your rare pathogens, and they're listed on the left there. They include like Mycobacterium terrae, Mycobacterium immugenum. I think a few years ago at one of the institutions I practice, I won't mention which, um, we had a uh, immunogenum bacteremia and in a dialysis patient and as it turns out it was um, it, it was a case of, uh, of water contamination of dialysis filters. So occasionally that will occur. You may see a rare mycobacterial pathogen become a true pathogen in an unusual circumstance. Now um, how about on the right hand column there, My Mycobacterium gordoniae. Well, wouldn't you know that this very morning I did a uh, electronic consult at my institution and um, it was a, regarding a patient who had a positive AFB smear that came up after several weeks. Uh, the provider was very concerned and it turned out it was M. gordoniae, which is known as the tap water um, bacillus or tap water um, scotochromogen, which um, is almost never a pathogen, usually a contaminant or a respiratory colonizer. So um, among the NTM organisms, uh, there, there are certain uh, classification um, details that I wanted to mention. So this is the common, what's known as a Runyon classification. And on the left there, you have Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, of which it includes T tuberculosis, M. bovis, Africana, Mic Microti, and, and Leprae. On the right-hand column, you see that there are both what are known as the slowly growing mycobacteria and the rapidly growing mycobacteria. 
So the slowly growing mycobacteria include the photochromogens, the scotochromogens, and the non-chromogens. So what is a photochromogen? That includes, for example, M. marinum, a photochromogen. So a photochromogen, what that means is that they make a yellow-orange pigment only when exposed to the light. So, for example, if you um, grew M. marinum in the dark, they would not have a pigment. But if you grew them in the light, um, they would produce a pigment, a yellow-orange pigment. Scroto scotochromogens, which include, for example, M. gordoniae, which we just talked about, they make pigment when? Actually, in the dark or the light. It doesn't matter. So, um, but for purposes of differentiating them from the photochromogens, they, make, they also make pigment in the dark. Now, what about non-chromogens? For example, MAVM complex. So MAVM complex, being a non-chromogen, doesn't make pigment at all. So that's the difference between the three categorizations. And then you have the rapidly growing mycobacteria, which are separately classified. So for example, this is uh, M. cansaceae, which is a, which is a photochromogen. Um, you see that uh, at the top photo, they were not exposed to light. You see the, the typical, they're sort of, um, you know, kind of a round, irregularly shaped, kind of cottage cheese almost type of, of, pa of, uh, of culture, uh, morphology on the media. And then you, you expose it to light and you reincubate it and it makes the orange yellow pigment, right? Here's um, M. avium. Again, remember that's a, a non-chromogen and it doesn't make pigment. And this presumably is in the dark. And then you see M. gordoniae, which is a scotochromogen in the dark, and it makes the yellow-orange pigment. So what are some uh, predisposing conditions for non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease? So you have patients, w anybody with lung impairment or damaged lungs. So somebody with cystic fibrosis, including the odd dalt onset variants, you would, they would be susceptible. Somebody with Cartagenor sy syndrome or Cart Cartagenor syndrome or a modal cilia syndrome, they would be susceptible. Anybody with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that causes progressive lung disease. This is interesting. How about somebody with GERD or aspiration? Anybody who sort of damages their lungs and causes inflammatory change by the aspiration of, of acid material, they can also be susceptible. So I think we should, you know, when we see a patient with non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease, we should ask them, you know, do you have problems with GERD? Have you ever been an aspirator? Because that's a risk factor. Somebody with prior in lung infections that cause damage to their lungs, like TB or histoplasmosis, and we've already seen patients with established immunocompromised state, like HIV, immunosuppressive drugs, or anti-TNF-alpha blockers, <clears throat> some more than others. Now, let's say you have the fibrocavitary. This is the COPD patient with uh, chronic lung disease. What are some typical clinical syndromes? You may see the insidious onset of cough, mucopurulent secretions, occasionally bloody. It can be nonspecific, dyspnea, fever, chills, and night sweats, recurrent bronchitis or walking, uh, walking pneumonia, vague malaise or diminished energy, focal chest discomfort. You know, we see these patients. It's, it's sort of a, a, a syndrome that we all know intuitively. So here is a patient with MAI, a COPD patient with, a cat, with typical cavities, fibrosis, you know, this is um, the, the typical patient that we see with uh, fibrocavitary disease with COPD. And do you treat them or not? You know, based on a lot of different factors. We'll talk in a, a little bit later. Now, how about um, the nodular bronchiac bronchiectatic patient or nodular bronchiectasis? This is the so-called Lady Windermere syndrome. So Lady Windermere, as you're all familiar from an Oscar Wilde play about a fastidious female character who never coughs. So, you know, she's so dainty that um, she has a cough, but she doesn't want to cough because it's, it's rude to do so. So as a result, she doesn't clear her secretions and she develops non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Typically involves the right middle lobe, left lingula, areas that may be more dependent upon voluntary inspectoration. So someone with um, pulmonary NTM with 
the so-called Lady Wind Windermere syndrome, will tell you that she has no preceding history of chronic lung disease, never been a smoker, you know, no history of, um, let's say, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or cystic fibrosis. You know, doctor, why do I have this? I, I'm healthy. I'm not a smoker. And uh, they may have uh, fever and weight loss, but it's usually unusual. They have persistent cough. Um, as I said, usually the right middle lobe or lingular infiltrates and no predisposing lung disease, volume loss, adenopathy, or cavitation. So here's a uh, female patient with nodular bronchiectasis. So again, there's no cavities, there's no, none of that chronic scarring that's associated with chronic lung disease. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of picture. So what is the routine evaluation for non-tuberculosis mycobacterial infections? Well, a chest x-ray obviously should always be done. But if you're concerned about uh, location or if the findings are subtle. Sometimes you can't really see NTM disease that clearly or that well on a standard chest x-ray. Then obviously you want to go to a non-contrasted um, high-res CT thorax. You want to check AFB sputums to see if, if they're showing evidence of non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease in their sputum. And you want to rule out other disorders. And a comment about AFB smears. I think that, the, you know, they're it, they are not just that the patient is smear positive or culture positive, but the details of it. For example, if you have somebody who is smear negative or concentrate negative, and they and their culture is positive on broth only, versus someone who is smear negative and positive on solid media, versus someone who's um, smear uh, positive and and culture positive versus someone who's very smear positive comes back right away. All those things, they're subtleties, but all those make a difference because someone who's only positive on broth only and is smear negative, that person may be more likely to be a colonizer or a contaminant than someone who is immediately smear positive. You know, the the there's a certain threshold of organisms that define smear positivity, and there's a certain threshold of organisms that are, that are detectable on culture. The sensitivity of a culture is much higher than a smear. So um, the fact that somebody is smear positive, that implies a huge burden of organisms versus somebody who's positive on broth only. That's a very tiny quantity of organisms, and that will factor in your decision of whether or not to treat. All right, so culture is a cornerstone of diagnosis. There's a lot of sort of emerging gene probes and PCR tests. Um, there are uh, specific um, characteristics of uh, diagnosis. It's a rapidly evolving field. Um, I'm not a laboratory person, so I'm not going to go in that, into that today, but perhaps we can have this in a later lecture. It's, it is very significant about the, the, about, um, the its significance of laboratory diagnosis, but just be aware that PCR technology is an emerging portion of this, but typically if you order diagnostic testing on non-tuberculous mycobacteria today, it will be a culture as your primary method of diagnosis. So these are, um, these are slants of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and what can you tell about these organisms just by looking at these slants? So the one on the left, that's a non-chromogen, right? There's no pigment, right? And the other three produce pigment. We don't know about the details of light or not, but it's, it's interesting. Now you know about the photochromogens and the scotochromogens that you can tell immediately um, some details about these cultures just by the fact of which ones make pigment and which ones don't, do not. All right, so we're going to talk about um, specific uh, pathogens. So let's talk about Kansasii, which were 10 in where we practice in, in Central Florida, we're, less, we're least likely to see, right? So Kansasii, not a soil pathogen. Highest incidence is in the Midwest and the Southwest, not the Southeast. Usually recovered from the tap water. And smear, it's very similar to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, I think, in a lot of different ways. But it's not a person-to-person um, -person transmitted infection.
you can have dissemination in the immunocompromised. The actual clinical manifestations are, are also very similar to tuberculosis. It can cause suppuration, caseation, and nodular disease. So this is someone, a COPD patient with low-grade fever and cough for three months. You can look at their CT scan. This patient has M. Kansasii lung disease. So you might look at this patient initially and say, wow, this patient probably has TB, but in fact, they have Kansasii because Kansasii is very similar to tuberculosis. All right. Now, how about some key facts about rapid grower mycobacteria? The, again, um, the most clinically significant are the abscessus and its subspecies and fortuitum. They cause 95% of rapid grower mycobacteria disease. Anti-TB agents are ineffective. So you can't use rifampin, you can't use a thambutal, INH, they don't work. And for rapid grower mycobacteria, the recommended susceptibility method is known as broth microdilution. And this is very similar to how we, um, how we determine MICs and susceptibilities on, re on regular bacteria, on, on non-mycobacteria bacteria. So how about abscessus? This is a rapid grow, of course. And in recent years, it's actually um, notable that there are three subspecies of M. abscessus that have clinical significance. You have the M. abscessus abscessus, also known as sensu stricto, meaning that it's the strict abscessus. Then you also have M. massiliens and M. boletti. Um, so abscessus was previously in, you know, Mycobacterium fortuitum chelonii complex. It was pre previously complex with chelonii, but we know now that abscessus is quite different, especially in terms of its clinical significance. It can cause surgical infections, post-trauma wound infections, bacteremia, disseminated disease. It can affect joints, can affect the lung, where it's most common. And there's a lot of different risk factors, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis. Remember, gastroesophageal disorder. So remember this as a pathogen in patients who aspirate or have GERD and older women without underlying pulmonary disease. Drugs for M. abscessus are very limited and macrolides work slowly. One of the reasons why <clears throat> resistance is common is because M. abscessus and M. chelonia only have a single copy ribosome that um, uh, determines resistance to amicacin and, and uh, macrolides. To, and so it's very easy to, for resistance to develop to those two types of antibiotics. Also, um, fluoroquinolones impact a single copy gene on abscessus, so there's a low threshold to resistance. Furthermore, there's this recently understood inducible ERM gene. Um, it stands for erythromycin um, uh, ribosomal methylase, and it makes therapy more complex because this ERM41 gene, if it if, it, um, if the mutation is there, it confers inducible macrolide resistance to abscessus. And so once that happens, um, you have macrolide resistance and you have essentially untreatable mycobacterium abscessus infection. And because it's inducible, it may not be easy to detect. So you may have a, um, a susceptibility that says that there's uh, susceptibility to azithromycin or clarithromycin. But then, during the course of your treatment, they start to not respond. It's because this inducible gene has turned on, and they're really resistant to the macrolides now. And now you have very few options for treatment. Now, how about MAC, or MAI? Again, we said you have the fibronodular, you have the nodular bron bronchiectasis. We already know that. Um, these are the different subspecies. Again, we talked about diagnosis. And, um, but an important thing at the very bottom there that I repeatedly emphasize, with the exception of macrolides, in vitro susceptibilities to MAC are not shown to correlate with clinical response. And that's why you will never see a susceptibility panel to MAC that the lab allows to go through, except for macrolides. Because really, all the other drugs that you would normally treat MAC with, clinical susceptibilities have not been shown to correlate with with uh, response, so they're really useless. 
So really, you look at the macrolide susceptibility, you take that into account in your therapy, and then you treat with whatever you have to treat with. The other, the other um, susceptibilities to, let's say, rifampin or rifabutin or thambutal, they really don't matter with MAC. They do matter with, for example, the rapid growers, but not with MAC. That's important to remember. So here's uh, an M Mycobacterium avium complex infection. This would be what type of disease? Would it be the uh, nodular bronchiectatic or the fibrocavitary? Fibrocavitary, right? Because you see a humongous cavity there. So uh, these are difficult to treat. Now, the last um, clinical guidelines for treatment of non-tuberculous mycobacterial diseases were published in 2007. So here we are in 2013. The, these guidelines are six years old. Maybe they're a little bit out of date and they need to be updated, but this is what we have to go by. So if you want to work up a suspected mycobacterial infection, obviously you do your three AFBs. If they're smear positive and the patient has TB risk factors, you'd probably start them on treatment for TB, right? Or, or in some cases you may be able to wait, but um, if you're going to get the patient out of the hospital and they have TB risk factors, it's okay to go ahead and treat them for tuberculosis. And then when the AFB specimens come back, let's say if the PCR test comes back and your clinical suspicion is low, then you can stop the TB therapy, wait for their AFB identification to come back, and then treat them for NTM. Um, what the health department emphasizes is you, you, that a, um, a a TB probe is not 100%. So if the TB probe is negative, they prefer, they prefer not to take a patient out of precautions. And they may even advocate that you continue to treat the patient for TB until the culture comes back. Because the culture is the most accurate means of diagnosis, not the DNA probe. Now, do we believe that in practice in the hospital? I would say it all depends on your clinical suspicion. If your clinical suspicion is low and the DNA probe is negative, personally, I would take them out of precautions and I would, um, I, I would stop their TB treatment. But that's just me. Again, this is an area of controversy. Someone who's smear negative and culture positive, remember that implies that they have a smaller burden of organisms in their respiratory tract such that they could not be seen on a spun smear, but they still grew up on culture. They could be either MTB or NTM. So sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes you go ahead and treat for, M for MTB, depending on your clinical suspicion. Someone who's smear negative and culture negative, do they need more specimens submitted, or do they need a bronchoscopy? That's where you have to use your clinical um, skills to determine which route you want to go. So again, um, clinical and microbiologic criteria for diagnosing NTM disease. The important thing here to remember is uh, an, an important factor in determining the clinical significance of a positive culture or smear for non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease is in how many specimens did it occur. If it occurs in just one and it's, a, it's for example, a Mycobacterium gordoniae, to use an extreme example, one specimen of gordoniae, clearly not significant, right? On the other end of the spectrum, if it's multiple cultures or smears for MAC, well then it's more likely you would want to take that seriously, right? That's much more clinically significant. So the number of specimens, and if you look at the guidelines, they say at least two separate expectorated sputum specimens or one bronchial lavage, right? Because bronchial lavages are much more sensitive. So, and then you can also get into transbronchial biopsies or lung biopsies which show histopathologic uh, features. At that point, you're getting into the tissue level of diagnosis, and the tissue level of diagnosis is much more significant. If you excise a pulmonary nodule and you see um, AFB in the tissue, well, then it's more likely that that's significant, right? And you want to, treat, want to take that seriously and very likely treat that patient. Now, what about treatment? Let's talk about treatment. Kansaceae, important pearls. You, it, it's treated very much like mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, you know, with TB, you have your RIPE therapy, R-I-P-E. Well, take out the P. It's R-I-E, 
PCA is not effective against Ken's ACI. So you treat this very similar to TB except with, not with pyrazinamide. Other drugs with activity are listed there. These are the summary of the uh, 2007 guidelines uh, uh, treatment recommendations for Ken's ACI. Again, RIE and the goal is 12 months of negative cultures while on therapy. They mention here that recent data suggests that macrolides um, may be substituted for INH, but it's not part of their recommendations. How about abscesses? Let me take a deep breath here. <sighs> Generally resistant to many antibiotics, and there's a growing call for speciation of organisms within the abscesses group because it's really the M. abscessus abscessus that's the bad player um, versus the other two that I mentioned. Um, like Bolletii and the other one that I'm escaping my mind at this time. Long-term cure of patients with pulmonary disease, very difficult. Oftentimes, surgical excision as an adjunctive portion of therapy is really important. And these are the drugs that are usually susceptible. Macrolides, clofazamine, which is difficult to get because it's used for treatment of leprosy and it's not easily obtained. Imipenem is an option, cefoxidin, amikacin, linezolid, tigacycline. Surgical resection should be considered in some patients if they can tolerate it. But finding the surgeon who's comfortable treating a patient with NTM infections to do lung resections is more difficult because again, this is not an infection that surgeons have a lot of experience with at the local level. Oftentimes you have to go to regional centers or national centers to find an experienced surgeon who treats non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. Now um, look what they say in the 2007 guidelines for treating, treating abscesses, which at, at, in 2007 was called Mycobacterium chelonia abscesses, but it's now called Mycobacterium abscesses. The only predictable, predictably curative therapy of limited M. abscessus lung disease is surgical resection combined with multidrug chemotherapy. Notice they say limited because sometimes surgical therapy is not an option because the disease is too extensive and you'd have to resect too much of the lung. And those patients are particularly difficult to treat because you don't have a surgical option. So what do you do with treatment? What are the classic treatment regimens for rapidly for M. abscessus in 2013? If you have serious disseminated disease, use your first two to eight weeks induction therapy, usually with a macrolide, assuming that, that it's susceptible to a macrolide, plus amikacin, plus either uh, cefoxin or, or imipenem. Sometimes you can use tigacycline. But that's it. Believe me, that's all you can use. Those are your options. Not a lot of options, right? Particularly if you have someone with who has resistance to macrolides. And then after the first eight weeks, you put them on more of a maintenance regimen for six months. Macrolide, hopefully, if they're susceptible. Sometimes you can use linezolid. But using linezolid for six months, that's really difficult, right? There's all kinds of toxicities. So typically, you use once a day linezolid, which tends to be a little better tolerated. You monitor them closely for side effects. What are some more details about treating abscesses? For amikacin, usually use once daily therapy, 7 milligrams per kilogram or 500 milligrams. Sometimes you can reduce the doses if it improves tolerability. Imipenem, usually given as 1 gram BID, um, at 1 gram twice daily. Um, Biaxin, either 500 milligrams BID or 1, 1,000 milligram XL daily. In other words, you do things to improve the tolerability of therapy at home. What about r other rapid growers like Fortuitum? Um, this is the most antibiotic susceptible. It also has inducible macrolide resistance, but it's not as significant as the ERM-41. Usually susceptible to numerous antibiotics, chiefly macrolides and fluoroquinolones. Usually treat with two drugs with demonstrated in vitro susceptibility for 12 months of culture negativity. Chelonier does not possess the ERM-41 gene, so that makes it much more susceptible to treatment. M many more drugs, you have options, typically macrolides, tobramycin, uh, linezolid, imipenem. Again, treat with two drugs with demonstrated in vitro susceptibility for 12 months of culture negativity. Macrolide, uh, MAC was much more difficult to treat before the era of macrolides. Now, as you can see, sputum conversion in the macrolide era is much better.
and there's a 65 to 80 percent success rate at two years. And when patients tend to not respond when they when they have positive sputum cultures again is is usually due to often due to reinfection. All right. So, what are some antibiotic regimens for MAC disease? This table, um, which I believe um, is from the 2007 guidelines, if I remember correctly, summarizes it very well. If you have nodular bronchiectatic disease, you can usually treat those patients three times a week, and that helps because remember the nodular bronchiectatic patients are usually a lot of times women who are very um, fastidious because of the name Lady Windermere's, but I don't want it to. I don't mean to um, categorize a certain category or group, but if you have a, a, let's say, a female patient who's previously healthy, who's not used to taking a lot of medications, they'll do a lot better with a fewer number of drugs three times a week instead of daily intensive therapy. So they tend to not tolerate therapy as well, and that's why you treat them three times a week, and they tend to respond. On the other hand, if you have cavitary disease, those patients need to be treated daily. And you may initially want to treat them with four drugs, including an injectable like, like amikacin, if their disease is seri serious enough, and then hopefully wean them down to three all oral um, for them to take. Somebody with advanced or previously treated disease, again, you may need to treat with that injectable drug for longer. And, uh, and their therapy is much more intensive, and it may involve um, higher doses. Um, and again, this is a summary um, about non-cavitary disease with MAC. Um, Macrolide and ethambutal are the essential core of therapy. Remember, you have your drugs in treating NTM that are more potent and less potent. An example of a less potent drug for treating NTM infections would be like fluoroquinolones, right? Because oftentimes the barrier to resistance is very low versus macrolides and ethambutal, which are your heavy hitters. Those are your very potent drugs. You want to make sure that your regimens include those drugs because the barrier to resistance is more difficult and they're much more potent. If you treated somebody, for example, with just a MAC, with MAC, with just clarithromycin and moxie, for example, you're, you're really doing them a disservice because, um, again, we, we said that quinolones are not that potent. And same thing with, um, with rifampin. If you treat somebody with uh, like clarithromycin and rifampin just with two drugs, chances are they're going to develop drug resistance because that's not a potent regimen. It's only two drugs. And remember about the importance of clearance mechanisms, especially in those Lady Windermere patients where you really want them to cough and ex learn how to expectorate. What are some therapeutic issues? Again, we talked about drug intolerance in the nodular bronchiectatic patients treatment failures, inadequate susceptibility methods for, um, for uh, non-macrolide drugs, particularly in MAC. Macrolide resistance is an issue, especially if you use weak combinations early on. And when do you use quinolones? Um, again, this is somewhat redundant, so I'll move on. Duration of therapy, again, 12 months of culture negativity. Patients do best when they're treated for 12 months uh, uh, of culture negativity, and the relapses tend to be fewer than if they're treated for a shorter duration. Um, what are some adjunctive therapy? Inhaled interferon gamma, there were some papers about that. Not as effective. Surgery, how do we select the patient? How do we get the CT surgeon to feel comfortable with these patients and operate on, on them? And the importance of bronchial hygiene and expectoration. Um, what if you have a patient who fails treatment? Well, you want to recheck them for macrolide susceptibilities. Maybe they've become resistant. Add an aminoglycoside maybe three to five times a week. Consider switching them to rifabutin instead. It may be a little bit more potent, although it's not as well tolerated. Consider surgery for localized disease. Some patients, the treatment's worse than the disease, and you just stop treatment and observe them. Consider continuing treatment if the patient's stable on their meds. Sometimes we have patients who you take them off treatment, they get sick again. You put them back on treatment, they do well. You take them off treatment again, they're sick again. So you just decide, I'm going to leave you on treatment because you do better on treatment and you're tolerating it. These are indications for surgical therapy. 
what are some other uh, clinical controversies? Um, again, when, when do we reach a point where non-macrolide susceptibilities help? Will there be more clinical data? Right now, the answer is no. Which drug is more effective, azithromycin or clarithromycin? We know that azithromycin is better tolerated. Clarithromycin may have a bit of an edge in terms of efficacy, although not for clinical purposes really um, in most cases. So in most cases you can use one or the other, but if you have a patient who's not doing well with azithro, do you want to consider them on clarithro, assuming that, th that it's still susceptible? You know, you might want to consider that. Which rifamycin is better, rifampin or rifabutin? When do you add an injectable? Um, when do you use three drug regimens? Um, there isn't that much, the clinical body of evidence for using three drugs over two is not that, is not that um, comprehensive. So it's not really known when you should use two versus three. When do you use Zyvox or linezolid? When do you use fluoroquinolones? When do you do surgery? All these things, if you ask the national experts, they throw up their hands. All right, so in summary, these are my treatment pearls for treating non-tuberculous infection. I want you to take these things away with you today. Kansasii, similar to TB, treat with RIE, take the P out. M. abscessus, remember there are now three subspecies and it's really abscessus, abscessus, that's the real bad one that has the inducible ERM41 gene that doesn't respond well we should be demanding that our micro labs subspeciate out these abscessus abscessus organisms because when when we identify them we know they're the worst erm41 gene is a growing issue with abscessus abscessus use drugs with demonstrated in vitro ap activity with abscessus two drugs in a macrolide surgery when there's um, geographically limited disease by an experienced surgeon and team may be your best hope of cure. MAVM complex, make sure they have disease before initiating treatment. The ideal regimen is listed and sometimes with the fibrocavitary disease you have to start out with four drugs and that's difficult to do. I can count on the fingers of my hands <clears throat> the number of cases where we've been able to successfully get somebody started on an injectable at home and continue them for a long period of time. And that's also compounded by drug shortages. In recent history, amicacin has been in short supply. It's been difficult to get amicacin for our hospital patients, much less our MAC patients who are being treated at home. And with that, I will conclude and take any questions.